So we'll begin tonight the way that we normally do with a guided meditation. So we can just find a comfortable posture for the body to rest. I'd like to begin our practice tonight with the land acknowledgement that I'm borrowing from the Native Governance Center. And so we can just receive the words. Minnesota is the homeland of the Dakota people. The Dakota have lived here for many thousands of years. Anishinaabe people reside here too and reach their current homelands after following the McGee shell to the food that grows on the water. Indigenous people from other tribal nations also reside in Minnesota and have made innumerable contributions to our region. Tribal nations negotiated government to government, preserving their sovereign land, rights and privileges through treaties. When land wasn't ceded through good faith efforts, it was often stolen from our indigenous relatives. In 1851, the Dakota signed the Treaty of Traverse de Sioux, ceding land in Southern and Western Minnesota to the United States government. Dakota le leaders faced insurmountable odds during the treaty process. In addition to inflating their unpaid debts, white negotiators from the federal government threatened to push the Dakota to the Rocky Mountains by force with 100,000 men. Dakota leaders had little choice but to sign the treaty to protect their people. In the end, the federal government has never paid the approximately 3 million promised in the treaty. Both the state of Minnesota and the United States government carried out genocide, ethnic cleansing, and forced removal against the Dakota as a way to acquire land. They broke promises. Despite centuries of colonial theft and violence, this is still indigenous land. It will always be indigenous land. Indigenous people are not relics of our past. Indigenous people are still here and continue to demonstrate talents and gifts amidst a backdrop of ongoing colonialism and oppression. Indigenous people are worth celebrating. Land acknowledgement is only one small part of supporting indigenous communities. We hope our land acknowledgement statement will inspire others to stand in solidarity with Native nations. Solidarity can look like donating time and money to indigenous led organizations, amplifying the voices of indigenous people leading grassroots change movements and returning land. So as these profound and stirring words settle into our hearts, I just invite their full and complete landing here.
as the body continues its processes, as the breath flows in and out, staying close. Feeling the residue of the words. And the undeniable connection of heart and body. And it's right here in the truth of our lives that we learn we don't have to reject this or that to be practicing. Just stand up in the middle of life. and learn what it's like to care. To care and to search for freedom. The body's breathing, moving, alive in such a dynamic way. And we know it's true because we can feel it. And the heart is sensitive, resonant. And this is also how we know we're alive. Is it possible just to allow experience life's processes to be what they are. Not standing in the way of the heart and its sensitivity Not denying the body and its sensitivity.
What could be more important than knowing the heart and feeling the body? With this deep, deep inquiry, what does it mean to be free? What does it mean to not deny life and be free? Allowing our own deep intuitive and creative wisdom to guide us. What do we nurture? What gets let go? We'll only know if we look and listen deeply. Staying really close. Intimate with chitta. Intimate with the body.
And opening your eyes whenever you're ready. Thanks for your practice, everyone. Taking a minute to move the body, stretch the body. You can stand if you'd like. Nice to take a minute to feel some way, feel into being in community. So if you'd like to turn on your camera, you're most welcome to. If you'd like to look around and wave and say hello, have at it. So if you've been following along in the book, um, Listening to the Heart, A Contemplative Journey to Engaged Buddhism, we're about chapter 11, about two thirds of the way through the book. And uh, yeah, you don't have to follow along to participate in these weekly practice groups. So, um, but if you'd like to, that's where we are. I'd like to tonight share some thoughts, reflections on this teaching of wise attention or Yani Somana Sikara. And Kitty Saro kind of goes into a description of this teaching in chapter 11. And it's been a Interesting just to reflect on what it means to listen to the heart and connection with this teaching. So I was flipping back through the book and some of the earlier chapters to remember the territory that we've traveled through this wonderful book. And in uh, one of the first few chapters, there's this quote from Ajahn Chah who was uh, one of the Thai forest masters and um, Kitty Saro and Tanisra's teacher. I don't know if I mentioned, I know I've mentioned almost every week, but Kitty Saro and Tanisra are the authors of this book that we've been working through. And so this is from Ajahn Chah. He says, Dhamma or Dharma is in your heart, not in the forest. Don't believe others, just listen to your heart. You don't have to go and look anywhere else. Wisdom is in you, just like the sweet ripe mango is already in a young green one. With even a little intuitive wisdom, you will be able to see clearly the ways of the world. You will come to understand that everything in the world is your teacher. Really poignant teaching here. Everything in the world is your teacher. With even a little intuitive wisdom, you will be able to see clearly the ways of the world. Even just a little intuitive wisdom. He didn't say, you know, you're gonna have to work at this for ages before any wisdom comes forward. So just watch out. <laughs> Be careful. He said, even with a little intuitive wisdom, you'll be able to see clearly. It's so beautiful. And we all already have that and it's developing. And then this other 
bit of wisdom from James Baldwin and these two pieces of wisdom from Ajahn Chah and James Baldwin have really been speaking to me. James Baldwin said, the world changes according to the way people see it. And if you alter even but a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. If you alter even but a millimeter the way people look at reality, then you can change it. With even a little intuitive wisdom, you can see clearly. In some ways, this is just like really goes to the heart of the practice for me. This invitation for us to learn how to trust what's moving in the heart and learn how to feel deeply into that with even a little bit of intuitive wisdom to feel so deeply that we understand something about the truth of human nature, about the ways of the world. And this kind of radical way of looking at life that we learn by walking this path is how we change the world. So listening, listening deeply, learning how to trust ourselves, really hearing what's moving here, trusting that, trusting the sincerity and the, the truth of what's here as a means to change the world, as a step in changing the world. And so seeing ourselves as practitioners, as Buddhist practitioners, as students, as change agents, primarily because of this art of listening, that we're the skill that we're honing as practitioners. And it's so much more than what we might consider, you know, this art of deep listening is uh, really so much more than what we might call mindfulness. And I don't mean that in like mindfulness isn't important because we could talk for a long time about the depth of mindfulness, but really this kind of deep wisdom that is a lawful act of nature, it's a lawful unfolding when mindfulness, when we hone the skill of mindful awareness when we really, and not in a very superficial way, like, but really to look deeply with our mindfulness practice. And this might feel like um, a creative process. I hope it feels like a creative process because it is. And this is the beauty of the teachings is that you know, they have flowed through so many people from the Buddha 2,600 years ago and all of the students who have who learned from the Buddha and taught other students and who showed up and shared something about practice and then other people learned. And, you know, it's like this beautiful web of bits of intuitive wisdom that have been shared person to person throughout history and time. And so this, the creativity that's involved in listening and really deeply understanding some, some part of what it means to wake up and find freedom from suffering is a very, is a deeply kind of personal, which might sound weird because we learn that things are impersonal, but it's a, it's a pretty personal expression. It flows through each human experience and each of us are slightly different. We have different histories and different ancestries and our minds, although we may be able to 
understand and something about the way the mind works and see, oh, wow, you know, this mind isn't quite that radically different from another mind. And that's definitely true. And each of us have, you know, conditioning, the, the conditioning that has flowed through this heart and body and this experience and this personal individual lineage is all a part of the expression of Dhamma. It's an expression of practice. The wisdom that can for comes forward is always changing based on conditions of our lives. And so it's such a beautiful thing to know that there are so many expressions of Dhamma. And there have been so many great meditation masters in recent generations and currently. And each sounding slightly different than the other because of this reality. So all of that to say that a, it's a sincere invitation, this practice and the teachings are sincere invitation for us to bring our own creativity, our own unique way of understanding and expressing that and sharing that with each other because our lives depend on it. And also to honor, you know, all, you know, as a way of honoring all of the expressions of Dhamma, all of the expressions of wisdom, we can think both in terms of our own lineage and ancestral expressions, you know, all the people in our history and generations of our family who have come before and have shared something with us and, and often, you know, some part of themselves that have helped us and shaped us into being the, the wise beings that we are, even if we're still learning, there's some wisdom here. And also the Asian lineage of teachers and students who have held the Dhamma for so long. Our Bur Burmese teachers, Thai teachers, Indian teachers, Sri Lankan, Korean, Japanese, Chinese. Like just to have a sense in our hearts of how many people have, you know, to me, I can sometimes think about like how many people have struggled through life, see, seeking, seeking, seeking in such beautiful and dynamic and different ways, thankfully in different ways to help us all con to contribute to a, a kind of collective wisdom stream that's available to us. So this path, this Buddhist path, the teachings that the Buddha lays, laid out for us is our pointers, but the responsibility to understanding is really up to us. It's much more creative and involves uh, the deepest listening. And when we really surrender to our preconceived notions about how to live and how to relate and begin with instead this serious inquiry that is about deep listening, we really learn that we're in many ways surrendering to not knowing. Like, oh, I don't know. And this is what we might call beginner's mind. I don't quite know how beautiful it is that there are so many ways to know. And so how does this heart know? How does this heart get close to the truth of freedom? How does this heart learn something about what it means to let go or to abandon craving or to learn not to reject the world because there's something to learn here? So this land acknowledgement that we reflected on is a part of that. It's a part of this, the history that we're all swimming in. 
And so learning how to appreciate and accept and invite in the deepest truth of our collective conditioning, as well as the conditioning of our own individual hearts and how that's flowed through history is a part of our awakening process. And for me, this question about what it means to find freedom as a is really, you know, as important an internal reflection as it is a collective reflection, as a reflection about the collective. And it's and we can apply the same values here, like instead of looking for an answer, being committed to the inquiry. Like, what is this? What is this that we're swimming in? What is this dukkha? What is this suffering? Where is it that we find relief? How is it that this heart knows relief? How is it that this heart knows freedom? What is collective freedom like? What does that mean? And this is this my reflections tonight certainly not mine, but the reflections that I'm offering tonight are certainly informed by this, the current context of our times, right? That the times that we're living in as much as the Buddha's teachings were, the way that the Buddha taught was specific to the context and times that people were living in then. There's this very, wonderful, you know, story at the Buddha after his enlightenment. And it is said that the first person he encountered after his awakening, this person walked by and said something like basic, like, who are you? And the Buddha said, I'm the Tathagata or something like this. Like a fully awakened being, right? And the guy was like, okay. All right, dude, and just kept walking. I mean, probably didn't say all right, dude, but maybe something like that, something, you know, he didn't stay around to hear. And it's not like that was an untrue statement, very true statement. Yet it didn't, it didn't meet the person, right? There was no interest there. So the Buddha learned to adjust, learned to change and adapt the way he taught to meet people. And so what is, how do we, you know, understand these teachings that are, that make them really useful to us in, in the ways that we need to, that are supportive in our lives. And here in Minneapolis and not just relevant here, it's this, the whole world is watching the trial of Derek Chauvin will begin, jury selection will begin in just a few days the trial it was for this one officer charged with the murder of George Floyd, the killing of George Floyd. I've just been educated today that murder is a legal term and killing might be the most appropriate word. I don't know. I've been using the word lynching lately because I've grown to appreciate the definition. But as we enter into this new season, and as we make our way through this reality of the, the trial, what does it mean to be, this question about what does it mean to be a Buddhist practitioner at this time? And how to apply the, the same trainings that I'm deeply invested in like many of you to what's moving in the collective. So this teaching, Yani So Manasakara, can often be translated as wise attention, wise attention. I really appreciate the way Kitty Saro describes this phrase as he talks about the what, what it, the quote is from the book is placing the mind and its activities in the womb of awareness. Yani so, it's womb. So it's really about 
going to the root, going to the deepest place, directing the, not even directing, receiving in the womb of awareness, all of life. Radical reflection is another way that Kitty Saro describes Yani Somana Sikara. And radical has its, uh, it's connected to root or the place where all things merge. So this deep origin or the source. And so what does this mean for us? The source, when we think about wise attention or the source, the deepest source of things. This attention that is grounded in the deepest truth of our experience. In order for our practice to bear fruit, we need this wise attention. And this is the energy that allowed for the Buddha's awakening, right? this wise, this wisdom, this wise attention. In every moment, there is attention and intention. Attention and intention informs everything we say, everything we do, the way we move our bodies, our engagements, our relationships. And inherently, attention and intention are both neutral. But they're neutral because they can each bring about a wholesome or an unwholesome result. So when we consider this teaching on wise attention, then we're also considering the intentions that have preceded that have, that have informed often preceded action, but the intentions that inform each moment. So our attention welcomes the depth of our intentions. Yeah. And if we can think about this a little bit more and see that we, you know, it's not hard to see that we're making choices in every moment about how we attend to life, right? We choose how we attend to everything, including our thoughts and how we use our bodies. And again, the relational experiences that we're having and our community engagements, our activism, our work, all of this, we're always making choices about how we, how we attend in the world. And so this yani so manasakara is the ability to ask ourselves deep questions in our, about our experiences, like questions that go straight to the depth of the sensitivity of the heart that really go straight to the depth of the pain and the pleasure or the joys and the sorrows that we experience in, in life. So this, this deep, wise attention, deep attention is kind of this knowing, you know, that of the possibility of a mind without confusion. And we can see that mindfulness alone isn't, isn't liberating. Right? Without, without wisdom, mindfulness alone isn't liberating. And there are lots of ways that mindfulness gets applied in our lives. You know, there's kind of a mindfulness, mindfulness-based anything movement these days. And whereas mo much of it is, is quite useful and skillful, we can see, you know, what the Buddha meant by, by this teaching around how intention and untention are inherently neutral, but can 
because they can both support skillful and unskillful actions. So there's, you know, mindfulness-based stress reduction, mindfulness in education, mindfulness-based running, mindfulness in the military, like the list goes on and on. And you could say, you know, like, okay, well, could you do something totally unskillful, but really mindfully? Well, absolutely, right? You can do great harm really mindfully. You can pay close attention to what you're doing. But this, the depth of our, the transformative depth of our practice comes from understanding our intentions that inform the moves that we make in life that inform how we how we live in really nuanced and very sensitive ways right all of the things that we say and all of the things that we do so it's a way of this yani so manasakara is a way of framing what we're doing and what we're giving our intention attention to The Buddhist teaching is on wise attention is that one wisely attends to experiences that are worthy of deep attention. So what is that? Well, topics where unskillful states do not arise, skillful states, we're like choosing where we put our attention. So when unskillfulness arises in the heart, the heart learns how to relate to that, right? How, how to not feed doubt, for example, or not feed hatred, and how to nurture states of compassion and patience and generosity and gratitude, right? These healthy, skillful mind states that support uh, that support freedom from suffering. And the heart learns how to let go and not nurture these other mind states that aren't supportive to our collective, our individual or collective well being. I was trying to think of like a real, a real relational example of what, of this means to decide where our attention goes, right? Wise attention is this capacity to have some choice. And so I was remembering that, I was remembering this, uh, this uh, meeting of some that I had meeting. It was, it was a book club meeting actually with some really, uh, some good Dharma friends of mine. And um, there was a, a moment when, when this heart was like really full of a lot of self, uh, well, self-loathing is the word that came to mind, but you know, just kind of not feeling really good about myself and what I was saying or how I was understanding things. And, and instead this, and in, you know, and that there wasn't a lot of space there to actually let go of that. So this is one of the lessons that we learn from practicing with this teaching is that sometimes the mind is, can be flooded with uh, un an unwholesome or unskillful mind state, you know, like when self-doubt kind of takes over or self-loathing or self-hatred takes over or when hatred takes over or deep anxiety takes over or deep fear takes over, 
And sometimes we have to we have to work with that in really creative ways. So in this particular instance, when this negativity started to emerge and there didn't seem to be a lot of space to to work with it, even though I was practicing, you know, discharging the energy, encouraging the energy to move by breathing and and moving the body a bit, what seemed to be natural was to focus, to direct the attention to this beautiful unfolding of Dhamma that was happening because of the trusting of relationships among spiritual friends, right? Like this heart could actually feel that in part because of this container that was established, this container of friendship that was there. And there was some trust in the room. And, and so the heart then, then you know, found some space to both not reject what was moving in the heart, but actually reside in a more skillful place, right? Like, oh, there's some appreciation, some gratitude here. And there was a lot softer and some kind of uh, release of the intensity of that energy. So just an example of some of the, the ways that we, or one of the ways that we might practice with this uh, development of wise attention. I'm reading this great book called Finding Freedom by Jarvis J. Masters. Jarvis is a, a teacher that um, was a part of the Black and Buddhist Summit recently, which is a wonderful, was a wonderful week-long event. Um, different teachers offered teachings, Black and Buddhist teachers offered some of the most beautiful teachings I've heard in a very long time. And um, Jarvis was one of the teachers there. He is a, a man whom Pema Chodron calls a student or a, a teacher of hers, He's a bit from his bio. Jarvis J. Masters entered San Quentin State Prison in 1981 and has been on death row since 1990, where he spent over 21 years in solitary confinement. The author of That Bird Has My Wings, the autobiography of an innocent man on death row, as well as numerous articles, he has won a Penn Award in 92 for his poem, Recipe for Prison Pruno. And here is a statement, a uh, page I think was a wonderful description of Yanni Somanasikara. I was walking out on the exercise yard last week along the fence, staring up at the beautiful clear sky. It was a gorgeous day. Then something frightening happened. Someone got stabbed on the adjacent yard. In the gunman's tower, prison guards were racking rounds into their rifles. They were shouting at two guys scuffing and fighting and trying to kill each other. I knew immediately that someone was going to die. Either the guards or one of these two prisoners would be responsible for taking another human's life. The tower gunman ordered everyone to lie face down on the ground. As they swung their fully loaded rifles around the three adjacent yards, I didn't know what to think. Since I didn't hear any gunshots, I figured the two guys must have stopped fighting. At least the gunman had been saved from taking someone's life. But what about the prisoner who had been stabbed? Was he dead? What had I been thinking about before all this happened? Was he dead? Why am I lying here like this? Is this all real? Shit, how long could I go on trying to be a Buddhist in this prison culture that has me lying face down? Who am I kidding? Just as I thought my head would explode from so many flashing thoughts, I locked onto a single idea, how some people in this world have only a tragic five seconds to put their entire lives in order before they die, in a car crash or in some other sudden way. I realize that what really matters isn't where we are or what's going on around us, but what's in our hearts while it's happening. I used to feel I could hide inside my practice, that I could simply sit and contemplate the raging anger of a place like this, seeking inner peace through prayers of compassion. But now I believe love and compassion are things to extend to others. Yet I see now that we become better people if we can touch a hardened soul 
bring joy into someone's life or just be an example for others instead of hiding behind our silence. The key is in using what we know. This calls for a lot of practice. There is this vast space in life to do just that, both as a practitioner and as someone who walks around the same prison yard as everyone else in this place. I've learned how to accept responsibility for the harm I've caused others by never letting myself forget the things I did and by using those experiences to help others understand where they lead. Isn't this a beautiful example of deep, deep attention, of wise attention of Yani Somana Sakara. Like really going to like taking this one experience lying, lying down and this incident that happened in prison and really going to the depth of the Buddhist teachings here. Like, what does this mean? What does this mean for me? How is this onward leading? How, and so we can ask this question all the time. We can have this inquiry all the time. You know, it really can make this what seems like a mundane, ordinary life in moments, the, the deepest, most powerful teaching available. You know, sitting down to have a meal can be a really profound experience. If we take the time to clarify our intentions when we eat, when we take in the food, we take the time to remember where the food came from and all the beings and the earth and the activities that conspired to allow us the food that we have to eat and really take it in with some reverence for life. And so many other ways that we can deepen our experience with what it means to be alive, to appreciate the heart that can feel and know, and to also appreciate, you know, our unfinished business in this way, like, oh yeah, we're, we're still growing. Don't know what to do here. Don't quite have all the information. So I'm going to move through this experience of participating, keeping my eyes open and my heart open as the trial unfolds with a lot of humility. Like, ah, oh, I'm going to learn. I'm going to listen. And this is what we do. Can participate with our own hearts in this way. I'm going to learn. I'm going to listen. I'm going to appreciate all the forces of greed and hatred and delusion that flow through this heart and flow into the world. And I'm going to Notice that there's this possibility of goodness around every corner. There's this possibility of looking at life, changing the way we look at life, even by a millimeter. It's like Jarvis was pointing to the five seconds that so much is at stake right there. Five seconds. So how will we use the next five seconds of our life? Squandering it or, or really participating, understanding that we're participating in something beautiful for the next generation of human beings. Right? Appreciating all that has come forward from our ancestry out mixed, right? Some delusion, some wisdom, a lot of effort. And here we have this opportunity to leave a legacy with our practice for each other, for children. It's such a beautiful, it's a beautiful reflection for me. I hope for you too. So I wanted to save a little bit of time tonight for discussion. Love to hear what you what you think, what's moving for you, what's come up for you about creativity, about the depth of wise attention, about what you've learned by deep listening in your life, how you've made sense of 
of things and how you've continued to inspire yourself to keep moving forward, keep looking. have anything to offer, share with the, the group, please just unmute yourself. And as always, there's no getting it right. We're just a group of suffering human beings trying to learn how to suffer a little less. So share your bit of intuitive wisdom with the, with the room in the service of our collective well-being. Reminds me of Seven A Selassie uses the phrase unbearable complexity. Just really uh, validates what it's like to be a confused human being who's trying to find freedom for me and kind of the unbearable complex complexities of life. It feels like such an important, yeah, important to, to remember, like it feels that way. And, and somehow the teachings are pointing to this possibility of freedom right there in the midst of unbearable complexity. So to just live with that question, like, what is it? How do we find, how do we, how does this heart find freedom now? Does it like have to reject what's unpleasant or unfinished or unresolved or unbearable? Or is it possible to em somehow embrace or at least accept that this is life? And in that surrender, you know, what, what happens there? Does the mind like really let go of its incessant complaining or trying to think our way out of something in a thoughtful way and be able to drop into this more intuitive space that is able to live with it, live with the unbearable complexity. Yeah, I can really relate to that. Sometimes this, you know, this mind will think that it's working, my practice is working, whatever I'm doing, when there's resolution of the thing I don't like, right? <laughs> like anxiety or whatever. Like, oh, well, let me try this so that. <laughs> So you quiet down anxiety and then, yeah, fixed it, right, Jillian? For sure. Yeah. And the, the compassion that's like, okay, you can live in the background all you want. It's fine. Can, you know, anxiety, you can just stay here and hang out for ever if you want to. I'm going to See if I can appreciate that you're just gonna hang out back there. I'm gonna just keep doing my life, right? Notice, see what else there is to notice here. So that can be a real compassionate response and a way to withdraw the attention from getting so absorbed into the content. Often it's the content of the thoughts there and to um, encourage this heart to notice more. There's so much more. Right. Yeah, that feels compassionate and really beautiful. Okay, well, thanks everyone for being here for your kind attention and your practice. Oh. Ask Patrice one once again, you'll dedicate the merit for us. So let's bring our attention to our intention to commit this wonderful act of imaginative generosity. If there's been any merit 
any blessing, any goodness that comes from our practice tonight, we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it with others. In fact, if we could, we would give it all away, every bit of it. We would give it to our parents, our teachers, our families, our friends, our community, to persons we know and don't know, persons we like and don't like. In addition to the two-legged, we give it to the four-legged, the many-legged, the winged, the scaly, the slithery, all the beings everywhere. May all beings be free from suffering. May all beings find a path of peace. Thanks, Patrice. This makes me so happy to send it to the scaly and the slithery. <laughs> Thanks, everybody. See you again.